Hey, Brian. Hey, Crank. How are you? Good. How's it going? Good. Randy, I think, is going to join us today. Bryson uh, is was in my band, uh, our band, Omdahl Wolf, as uh, is Randy uh, Deitch. Uh, so, um, and I've got a little surprise for you, Bryson, uh, uh -oh. at the very beginning. All right, a few more seconds and we'll start. And Ken is going to have this um, record on our new YouTube channel, which he set up. Uh, so by the way, Ken is our new chair for Heartland Renewable Energy Society. Wave, Ken. There we go. Hey. <laughs> and he's done a lot with the website and with the YouTube, setting up YouTube and getting us uh, uh, more accessible to more people. Today's presentation is going to be lots of slides of homes and concepts. And we started out, uh, or I started out back in 1978 when I was playing in a group called Omdahl Wolf. And we used to do lots of original music. We were unusual in that way. And that original music is what really gave me my um, self-education on philosophy. Uh, so, a, a, and a lot of the slides are gonna be of the first house I ever built, which is Wolf, I call Wolf One, in case you're wondering where that phrase came from. And so, as I was building the house, two things happened. My band broke up, Omdahl Wolf, and with Gary Omdahl, he and I started as a, as a duo, and then we became a five-piece group. And my builder became unreliable. So as, uh, as fate would have it, uh, I started a new career before I knew I needed one. Because uh, from building my own house, I went off and became a passive and super insulated home builder. And that, that ride lasted about a decade, a little bit more than a decade. So what I wanted to start with is um, a chorus and a verse of a song by Amdahl Wolf that kind of, uh, kind of explains it with our original music where our hearts and minds were at. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now and we will go off and do that. And by the way, the song uh, uh, was co-written. Bryson Innes, who is with us here, um, uh, wrote the music and I wrote the lyrics. So, and that was the only song that we ever uh, collaborated on. But in my opinion, it's the best song we ever did. So, uh, so I'm going to share my screen now and begin the began. Okay, so uh, this is a friend of mine, and she, she and I um, were the financiers of this house, and then she later left, and I was, um, she was replaced by Jamie Wolf, who has been a, um, a strong and lifelong partner. But what she's standing right where the house, my house was built, and behind her is the oak tree on the west side of the house that determined where we actually um, 
planted the house. That's the reason we planted the house there because it provided shade on the west side. Here's Diana and Jim Huddleston. And Jim was the one who encouraged me to do something because originally I had just designed a, 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 a an L-shaped log house. And he said, well, with your philosophy and priorities, you ought to do something different. And with that, uh, I began studying and learning about passive solar and super insulation, but mostly passive solar in those days, trying to figure out the difference between active and passive solar. So there was a gentleman by the name of Wayne Nichols, who was a, um, a passive solar home builder in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And he's the, the grandson of J.C. Nichols. So we decided that we were going to go down and visit him. Uh, and that, so that began a road trip to Santa Fe. We took a vacation and went down there, stopped by Telluride, Colorado. <clears throat> so this is me in my better days. But we met a guy named Doug Balcom, and he was living in one of Wayne Nichols' homes. And this is the home that we more or less cloned our house after in terms of the concept of a of a two-story greenhouse. Uh, and that 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 particular design has some problems, which which um, uh, because you can't shade uh the, the the angled glass very well so uh i use a shade cloth to do that and did that from day one so uh, that was that was the point of that trip and here we see the uh beginning of the house this is a, a stake here by the surveyors another stake here and there's a stake back here so we began of course with the excavation i climbed up the oak tree to take this shot and here's the excavation this area here, as you will see later, this is where the greenhouse was. It has a, a raised patio in there. <clears throat> the house is actually a six-sided uh, symmetrical uh, house. I should have put a slide in there showing the outline of the house. But but the back is back here is 40 feet. The front is 30 feet. And then you've got like 15 feet here and here. And then this is 20 feet here and here. So here they are getting getting the footing in, poured the footing, and then here's the uh, the wall forms with the concrete curing. Wall forms are taken off, and here you can see the big oak tree, which we lost, by the way. Um, and so we later replaced that with a with a sycamore tree that had a six foot root ball so that we could have a giant tree on the west side of the house and it is doing spectacularly. Whoop. Uh, here's a picture of the foundation. There's my shadow. And here the carpenters have started. You can kind of see the shape of it. this. This area here is the greenhouse area. This is the kitchen. This is the entryway. Living room is right here. One of the bedrooms is over here. Uh, and uh, the carpenters gave me the honor of pounding in the first spike. So there I am doing my best to look like I know what I'm doing with a, with a sledgehammer pounding in the first spike. And here you can see the house beginning to take place. There's the downstairs bathroom right here. And some of the cedar timbers are being set up. Uh, so here you can see the inside of the logs that the builder that I uh, was using didn't use any insulation on the inside of the logs. And so I had to change that. And I'll show you later on uh, how I how I uh, changed it so that we would have an R19 wall by the time you add in the insulation as well as the uh, the, the R value of the logs, which isn't much. So here's the. Here's the beams starting to take place um, in, that are going to form the greenhouse. And now, now, now you can kind of see what the, what the place is going to look like. We've got the glass put in right here. And then another thing that I had to change is uh, in his design, the builder's design, um, is just a two by six going up here. And so what I had to do was come back 
and add a two by two on all these so that we would have enough insulation to meet, reach an R30. Here you can see uh, some of the uh, rigid insulation that's being put on the roof. And then a big snow that happened, which uh, led to a lot of snow melting. And unfortunately, where that where all that snow went was right into the the basement. This is the picture of the of the uh, basement, and this is the low spot right here. And we had all of our furniture in the basement after the basement had been had the floor put in it, the concrete slab. So all the water was coming down here, and I was going crazy trying to keep the water out of our basement. So here, here is, and you can see the the two by twos uh, right here uh, that's scabbed on top of the two by sixes, uh, and then here's the additional insulation here that was put in. So, and then I'm starting to add the one by fours uh, here. Then th there's the, by the way, that little doghouse up there is for the attic fan. We have a, a vertically mounted attic fan that plays an integral part in the building of the home. And then here I am at the end of a day uh, working uh, on, on the roof. And right here on the lower right hand corner is the blue whale, which uh, Bryson can remember from because he remember one time we were driving to a gig and I was driving and it was in the snow and um, I fell asleep at the wheel and woke up going 55 miles an hour uh, in the median. And so he and I, after that, traded places and he, he finished driving. I remember that, yes. Yeah. yeah you do remember that. I figured you probably would. <laughs> yeah. oh, I certainly remember it. So here, here's the bare bones house um, uh, looking... Uh, pretty good and as you'll see later on we've done a lot to the outside of the house to uh, to finish that up go away uh, and then here we are on the inside of the house uh, you can see the vaulted ceilings uh, that the cedar uh, beams that are the structural component of it and here's another view of the ceiling so the the, the ceiling and the roof were one of the spectacular aspects of the home um, so this is the bedroom uh, now what I'm going to do I ripped down two by sixes and put them on four foot centers and then nail them in edgewise so that they had a, a three inch or a nominal three inch uh, two and three quarters actually and and so and then I put rigid insulation in between these ripped down two by sixes and you can kind of see this is this is the uh, edge of the house and the carpenters came up with this idea so they wouldn't have to try and rip down uh, six inch logs they made this structure and then use the uh, ends of the logs and from the outside you can't tell any difference whatsoever uh, that um, uh, it this is not a full log right here Here's the start of the fireplace. This is a Rumsford firebox, uh, which has an angled back of the firebox. So as the fire goes up, it heats that uh, angled part more and then causes more radiant heat out into the room. Uh, and here you can see the right here and right here and right here are the two by threes, if you want to call them that that I use and here you can see one of the uh, sheets put in place that help create the R19 wall and then here is a shot from the balcony loft area looking down and you can see the the two by threes and the and the insulation uh, that that goes uh, in the uh, in between the two by threes and looking from the upstairs bathroom you can see that the downstairs insulation is almost completely done and this shot had uh, I had to adjust it but that's why the photograph is of poor quality relative to the others but still you can see 
that then what I did was to take tongue and groove rough cedar and put it over top of the two by threes in the insulation and that that served as the inside of the house okay so uh, the house has lots of mass in it and this is some of the mass being delivered uh, which the in, separating the greenhouse from the house is a mass wall of brick and stone and mortar and here's there's the brick uh, which I was lucky to find a dark brick they had just enough of it and that served as the inside of the mass wall uh, inside to the greenhouse if you will so that the Sun hit that dark brick to absorb more of the Sun's energy and here we are looking down at it all It's Bob Zihusky. Uh, he's the one who came up with the fireplace uh, Rumsford concept. Uh, he's getting ready to put the first stone in. And for uh, Ken and Tess, he's the guy who came up with the idea. And he said, would you mind if I would put above the loft greenhouse door Namaste, which it, one of the interpretations of that word is I see your soul. So he was kind of a spiritual guy, did a great job on the stonework just unbelievable uh, and so here's the wall going up that serves as the thermal mass for the home with the dark brick on the sun side and the stone on the inside looking at it from that same shot from the inside and then here you can see a cross section of the wall where we had brick on the outside and then uh, the the brick layers also filled those voids with mortar as they were going up and then here's a shot of the inside of the house um, in one of its iterations of furniture. Um, and, and there's their speaker up here, which is my first dog, a little Rottweiler. And he was a great dog. Um, and then here is the inside completed. And you may not be able to see it. If, I, if we have a better shot of it, I'll show you. But up here, the, the brick only went so high. It didn't go all the way up uh, to the to the ceiling in the loft in the greenhouse area because on at 12 o'clock noon on December 21st when the Sun is its lowest in the sky that Sun line is right along the top of the brick we also use 55 gallon drums initially um, in the in the greenhouse to add additional storage filled with water but my um, but Jamie said, gee, that's not very attractive. <laughs> so she won that that round. And uh, we took those out eventually after several years and uh, put in uh, plant shells, which you I think you'll see later on. So here's the wall. It's a 16 inch thick wall. <clears throat> There's a uh, heat will travel through masonry material and from the sun's energy from hitting the wall to reaching the other side is about nine to 12 hours in terms of the speed of that conduction through the house. So the theory goes that uh, the sun will hit that mass wall and then nine hours later, we'll reach the inside of the house. And the, the function of mass is to store the sun's energy. But there's another element uh, regarding the sun's mass is that if you can see that warm mass and it can see you then you can feel more comfortable at lower air temperatures same thing goes with a wood burning stove or a fireplace <clears throat> if you can tolerate lower temperatures because of all that radiant heat hitting your body from a wood burning stove now this wall is kind of like little bitty wood burning stoves everywhere that that is looking at you and so you are able to tolerate lower air temperatures because of the radiant heat that's hitting your body. And here it is uh, before the carpet went down uh, of showing the, the stone mass wall. And here is uh, just a reminder of what the home looked like before. And here is where it ended up looking like after we got done with our, with our gardening. Um, uh, Jamie and I called ourselves out of control gardeners. We ended up, um, uh, and in fact, I think the buyers of our home 
Tess and Ken are on the on the phone or on the line here with us, and we ended up with 5,000 square feet of perennial gardens that covered the property, and I'll show some pictures of that of those gardens later on. So here's a shot, another shot of the thermal mass inside the house. This is this is what we can see and it can see us and provides us with radiant heat. Here's another shot. You can see that the 55 gallon drums are placed with something that's a little bit more aesthetic uh, with these plant shells. Here's the other side of the greenhouse. So now we're going to just rifle through some outdoor shots of the of the gardens. Looking up the driveway, looking back toward the garage. This is at the uh, on the east side next to the little uh, stone uh, garage for the property next door. Looking up the driveway, looking down the sidewalk toward the front door. So I'm standing in the driveway looking toward the front door. This is in the backyard. You can see these this thing going on on the right hand side. Uh, this is we call this a ground gutter because what would happen if we get a gully washer, uh, mud and stuff would overflow and get into the stone, uh, uh, pebbles, etc. And that became a pain in the neck to try and get cleaned up so we created what we call a ground gutter to grab the water before it gets into that part of it and here the ground gutter is looking up now i don't know if i have a shot of the uh, one on the other side but there's a ground gutter right below here uh, that also goes down and this is in the backyard looking up at our deck our deck was a, a monstrous deck about 1200 square feet looking down toward uh, this the um, uh, let's see go back where are you where am I uh, I don't know where that picture went but that's okay uh, so here we are looking up the path oh there it is I don't know why I couldn't see it, but that, that's a shot of the deck and the lattice work that covers the, uh, hides the inside of the deck, looking down toward, uh, toward the, uh, a little wood burning pit down here where you could have a, a fire. Oh, here you can see the ground gutter right here. This is the ground gutter on the other side of the, uh, of the backyard that takes water that comes off the roof and then down into this thing and then down into the woods. This is here's the uh, the pit, the little burn pit down here. I remember one night I came out. It must have been a, a great a great year for fireflies, and I ran inside to grab Jamie to have her look at it. But the entire backyard at night was just a glow with fireflies. Uh, it was just a, a magical magical view. And there's our fountain which we uh, couldn't resist because it looks like the sun and that's such a part of what is our philosophy of having the sun so that's the fountain we selected here's looking at the front yard this is called hosta row looking down there at that and here's the here's the butterfly garden or and now we call it the stonewall garden because our little butterfly boxes didn't really work that well so we call it the stonewall garden Looking at the house from uh, the stone wall garden and the sidewalk gardens. This is a look at the sitting garden, called a sitting garden because there's a chair behind these trees, and so its name is the sitting garden. Another shot of the fountain and some um, shrimp plant, a shrimp plant. So all of that led to um, my starting a company called Craig Wolf Solar Design and Construction. And the, the home design that I named was the Energy One Concept Home. 
And so we're going to see some of the techniques that we used back in the day um, to build the Energy One concept homes under the name of Craig Wolf Solar Design and Construction. And I was a member of the Home Builders Association. I was kind of one of the, uh, the rebels that pushed for uh, energy savings programs. Uh, you can see these are a couple of guys from Can't See Power and Light. There's Larry Gordon, who ran, uh, who was a, a vendor for builders, and he sold us uh, styrofoam insulation. This is Craig Iman, who was also uh, a renowned solar builder. Um, and we were both proud of what we did. So this is one of the slides that I would show a new client as, uh, as we were introducing them. It's called a Historical Look at Fossil Fuel Consumption. And uh, what back in when this was in the 80s, what we were concerned about, at least I was concerned about back in those days, is we're going to run out of fossil fuels. So here we are about when they discovered oil and and here we are at the peak and we're going to run out of fossil fuels and that was the big concern why why we had to do energy conservation and build passive solar homes etc didn't turn out that way because if we burn all the pa all the all of the oil that we can discover we're going to kill ourselves through climate change so we've got uh more than enough as this curve actually flows out here we've got more than enough fossil fuels in fact we've got way too many to burn so uh, and I would always show my my new potential clients the concept so there's three types of solar design this is called direct gain where the Sun's energy comes directly into the home and this is diffused glass up here so it it breaks up the sun coming in and uh, I use the it's called a clear story and I use this a lot um, and so this is the, a slab uh, hopefully a with a masonry floor that uh, collects the sun's energy and radiates it back to the inside of the house also hopefully if you've got a lot of glass on the south side you use window quilts or some other insulation here because that's your most vulnerable area for conductive losses now uh, and it is also what wasn't well known by many homes that would try to do passive solar is they've got too much glass and the home heats up too much what that does is it creates highs and lows so um, follow my mouse and this is the nighttime then it goes gets very hot in the daytime and then it goes gets very cold at night very hot in the daytime very cold at night and that's what thermal mass helps to do is to level out and to act like a thermal flywheel for um for for the home to absorb the sun's energy and keep it from getting too hot keep it from getting too cold this is called an isolated gain home that's what my home is i've got a sun space that's not conditioned and it, it uh, the sun hits this mass wall and then slowly after about nine to twelve hours conducts through the wall and then radiates to the inside of the home and then there's also something called an indirect gain and i built uh one of these with indirect gain and you'll, you'll see some shots of it later on where the glass is put right with a small airspace right up against the thermal uh, mass wall then you also have to get take in consideration the sun's uh, angle in the sky this shows the sun's path on june 21st and on july 21st and on august 21st and then february 21st january 21st <clears throat> and december 21st so ideally you've got your overhangs designed properly so that it doesn't overheat uh in the summertime that this overhang here keeps the home um, from having too much enter uh, too much sun um, or it, well it allows the sun to come underneath the overhang and into the home and then it's long enough that it blocks the sun from entering that south glass uh, in the rest of the year and this shows the variance in the sun's path here's the summer sunrise rising north of due east going high in 12 o'clock noon setting 
north of due west and then in the winter time rising in the southeast and going and setting in this in the southwest uh, and low in the sky at 12 o'clock noon so all of that goes to define your glass so <clears throat> well what i this was what i call the wolf wall although i'm sure i wasn't the first person to think of it but uh, uh enemy number one is air infiltration so i quickly learned in my building process that that was the animal that we really needed to address so what i did was wrap the house in six mil poly and so the technique was to put a uh, bead of this is rigid insulation on the outside of the foundation wall uh, put a bead of caulk down here you can see the bead of caulk here then we put poly into that with enough uh, poly running wild that we could wrap that poly around here and you can see right here we've cantilevered the plywood floor out an inch because what we wanted to do was to keep the poly right here to be a warm surface and you can see that with these one layer of rigid insulation here called thermax and that fits right here and then the other layer of rigid insulation that goes up the entire wall on the outside that's flush with the rigid insul insulation here you can see uh, the poly going down here you can see the poly that came starting at the foundation here and you can see the poly on the inside here if we're ready to receive a wall that, that goes up so then that poly then goes uh, uh, up the two by four but then we also added a two by two and put ridge uh, put uh, fiberglass insulation in this cavity you can see and we use this gap here for wiring and plumbing you can see how um, that is configured here and so here is here is the poly that started out at the foundation it's come under the wall then we put in rigid insulation here and then we put the two by twos on ran our wiring and plumbing again you can see that shot and then we added a, a thin layer of fiberglass on the inside of that and so then here's the final wall we use little strips of poly here and here and here to hold that fiberglass from falling out of the cavity and then uh, other areas of the house where we would reduce infiltration where you have a ceiling light fixture that went to the outside or went uh, into the insulation and then to the outside we would cut the poly slightly smaller than the dimension of that outlet box then we would wrap it around that push it around that so you had a tight fit of the poly against the box then we would finish by caulking uh, that poly to the insulate or electrical box as well as caulking with butyl caulk um, where the wires come into the box and you can see that then we ran poly up up this wall up up this vaulted ceiling or flat ceiling as the case may be and then we would run poly down the ceiling and we would run the poly so so it didn't run this direction it ran this direction so that we would have a, a vertical uh, point where we would put the sheetrock it would be pressed against the uh, butyl caulk and form to make sure that caulk stayed in place and so that's that was the design of the wall system and then of course in the attic you'd caulk any penetrations uh, on the top and bottom where you had plumbing or electrical wiring that came down into the condition space and around the windows uh, we would um, we would foam them with a non-expanding foam we would caulk the poly that was on the wall to the last stud creating the rough opening and then this just shows what we've already talked about in terms of the angle of the sun and the angle how that impacts the overhang in summer and winter and here's a close-up of the uh, running the poly with its seams going running vertical up the vaulted ceiling as opposed to across 
Now, because we took such care to make the house airtight, you've got all kinds of things that are outgassing in your house, cabinets, rugs, stuff that makes the air not healthy. So what we would do then is we'd use what we called back in the day an air-to-air -air heat exchanger. <clears throat> now that it's uh, they've got better devices, they call them an ERV, energy recovery um, ERV, ventilator, ventilator, a ventilator. <clears throat> but the function is the same in terms of how it treats air. You can bring in cold air from the outside. It runs through the heat exchanger and pulls off some of the heat from the uh, warm air that's in a bathroom that's coming down and goes into the air to air heat exchanger. So if, if air here came in at 20 degrees, it probably comes into the return air duct at 55 degrees or 50 degrees. So uh, in other words, it's a way of artificially inducing air or air infiltration in a normal house, you got plenty of air infiltration, but it's coming in at zero degrees or 20 degrees or whatever the outside temperature was. So it's an air to air heat exchanger. Your furnace uses an air to air heat exchanger so that you don't die when the furnace comes on. Your car uses a water to air heat exchanger so it cools down the water that cools down your motor. And there's what uh, one looked like in one of our homes. Now I have this shot in here and this will probably be on the website too if you want to read it, but um, this is the first home that I built using all these comp sets. It was the third home that I built in total, but it uses the wall system, etc. And I, I was friends enough with folks at Can't See Power and Light that they used uh, this home as a test case requiring that the homeowners keep the house uh, no cooler than 68 degrees or 70 degrees, whatever it was. And also that they not use their wood burning stove for this winter of 1982, which was a cold winter. And they went through the entire winter on, I think, $114 of electrical baseboard heat, because that's all we would put in there was electrical baseboard heat, which is an expensive heat to pay for, but is a very cheap source of heat. Uh, when you're installing it in the first place. And that's the equivalent to $55 of natural gas or about $13.75 a month. So the, the theory proved out and from, from then, that's what I used as my claim to fame to, to get clients until we didn't care about energy anymore. And Ronnie Reagan took the uh, collectors off the roof and people just lost interest in energy efficiency and have for many decades. So here's another home that, uh, oh no, this is the home right here in the wintertime. This is the Staggs residence, and this is the Brewer residence. They use the same design as the as the Staggs residence. Uh, this, uh, the lower level is earth contact. You can see here on the back of the home. And we're gonna have a little conversation about mass because in the greenhouse, as you can see from these these slides, We've got a, a greenhouse here on this side of the house. And so we're going to build some mass walls. So when we build these mass walls, you've got lots of concrete that's being poured in here. That's causing lots of pressure that wants to collapse this box. This box is where the doors are going to go. So then we had the same thing on the upper floor because the, the mass wall was a two story mass wall of 16 inches thick concrete. So the carpenters had to really make sure that when they built this, that it withstood the pressure um, trying to collapse that opening for the doors. And then here, here is the same uh, wall uh, showing, showing the wall and the doors uh, after it's been poured. Now the braces are taken out. And then here's the, the mass wall on the inside after the house has been finished and moved in. Uh, this is the same house showing the mass floor in that part of the house that has direct gain. You can see the sun uh, coming up here from above this. There's glass up above this beam. It's diffused glass, so it spreads the light out. And you can see the softness of the light here as compared to this light down here. Same lights coming in, it's just this, this light is more spread out. 
but this is the mass in the in the living room area and here's um boy i forget their names somebody will remind me later but they're doing a, an air blower test here um for to, to measure the home's tightness and the air infiltration and this just shows some of our techniques for uh pouring a slab and that you don't hear this this slab you want to be your thermal mass or your heat storage and you don't want it being impacted by the outside so we put that therm that uh, slab when we poured it with uh styrofoam insulation up against the the outside wall um uh, as well as going back about four feet on the inside uh and then here you can see you can, you can see it right there but we've got two inches of rigid insulation on the outside we've got a little knee wall for the stoop here uh and that uh, is also covered uh, with rigid insulation hey craig is an attic fan craig uh, and we put attic fans in our homes and if it, someone wanted an attic fan here was our technique we use two inch styrofoam as a cork that we would take and we take these blocks out uh, we had a little foam gasket on top uh, it, it's pushing up against that so that you had an airtight fit this is a piano hinge here and so you lift that up uh, and it's in place put it on with some butterfly nuts uh, to, to hold it in place and now it's there for uh, for your winter use when it's not in use Ken was trying to say something Ken are you trying to say something Or someone was trying to say something. That was me. Can you go back two slides? Yeah. Just, okay, just, a couple more, I guess. Just interrupt me. Don't, don't wait for me to. Well, back to the blower door. The blower door. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, well, well, right there. We happen to have that blower door still. Oh, and the do. guy that's running that test who you talked about, that's Court Crosby. Court Crosby. And this is, uh, what's his name? I don't recognize him. Henry Temkin. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and here's the guy from Aardvark Air. Um, Bruce. Bruce. Can't bring him back. Anyway, yeah, so these guys were were co-conspirators in terms of, uh, of, of believing that what we were doing was important and the right thing back in the day, as was, as was Bruce. Yeah, that's one of the original blower doors right there. Yeah. Right They've changed there. a lot since then. So this is one of the homes I built. Now we're going to see some of the, the structures that uh, Energy or the Craigville Solar Design and Construction built. This is the south side of the house. This is the north side of the house. And then this is the inside. Again, I used the clear story. Uh, this was the, the, the mass that we used in this home. Um, this was a, a spec home. So we uh, didn't put uh, carpeting down. <clears throat> That's a decision everybody has to make. Now, this is the home that has the indirect gain, which means that the glass is placed right up against the thermal mass. And that's on this side of the home here. And then over here is a little mini sun space. So we'll take a look at how that was done. So here's the thermal mass with the, uh, the, the support for the glass lagged into the uh, mass. And then we put a, a dark or a light a, a covering over that. And then we painted that black. And then there it is uh, after, it's, after it's all been done. Now, uh, Bruce, the guy from Aardvark Air, this is one of the things that probably isn't a very good idea. And we'll talk about that when we get later on today when we talk about heat pumps. But it, it, at the time, it was pretty innovative and then he used the the copper wire that holds the freon from the heat pump and wrap that around here and this white tubing is the, that you know once a week or so you turn on a faucet on the inside of the house and that would put moisture out into the soil to make sure that the clay soils hadn't dried out and shrunk back away from the copper pipe and we'll talk later on about why that's not a great system Here's another home, uh, use some earth contact on the back side. Back here, we'll see a shot of it. And we even put some earth contact uh, on the on what is the west side. 
there it is looking at there here's that same earth berm that's on the west side you can see some of the whoop. you can see get back yeah you can see some of the earth berming here on the um, on the north side and then also on the east side back here another shot and here's the uh, northeast corner uh, that is earth contact and they used um, terracotta for their thermal mass inside the home and then they also use window quilts from appropriate technology I wish they were still around they were a great company they had a great product I put it in just about every home I built that uh, changes the window from an R2 to uh, an R5 and uh, just as importantly if you're sitting next to this open window on a zero degree day you feel cold because your body has a negative radiant relationship with that glass and uh, the same thing happens in the in the summertime when I was putting up one of these window quilts on the south side it was it, the overhang was protecting the glass from having the Sun come in but it was still 96 degrees outside and I felt hot when I got the window quilt to the point where I could lower it my comfort level immediately increased because of my body wasn't being bombarded by the radiant heat uh, that the glass was reflecting into the room and onto my body so window quilts were a great great product another shot of the windows and the thermal mass another home uh, that was a spec home thermal mass was uh, the fireplace again up here is the clear story with the fused glass up there and then the, the um, thermal mass on the floor and they had a, a very efficient hearthstone wood burning stove uh, this is the the another residence by the Myers residence earth contact on the back side this is a colonial salt box uh, they wanted a colonial salt box but they wanted to pass a solar home so I put the glass over here on the south side and there's what that looked like on the south side and then here's the inside of the home uh, they've got terracotta floors for thermal mass and then a really nice big fireplace uh, another home uh, in Red Oak Hills this is the north side and then here's the south side of the home so they had uh, some levels down here that that are uh, earth contact this is a uh, julep residence the north side <clears throat> and the south side a direct gain home this is a home by larry lady um, a log home using 12 inches this this in this home the uh, logs were the uh, on the same log you see from the inside and the outside so you've got about an r13 out of it um, uh, and uh, this is the south side of the home with more more glass it's a beautiful home this is an earth contact home for the Hoffmans uh, showing uh, it's all direct gain kind of a multi-leveled home Here's the north side showing the the berm. Look, showing the south 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 glass. This is the Kong's residence, uh, which was an A-frame home. Of course, that's the south side. This is an office building that I built uh, for Dr. Novak, showing the north side, and then the south side. Verhege residence. A couple of remodels. This is uh one where we added a greenhouse to the south side of the home this shows a uh, the the uh, residence for the Haywards and this is the just a, a add-on remodel job there there it is before we added the room and here it is after we added the room you should see the big fireplace looking to the south 
One of my projects that never got off the ground was something that I was very sad and disappointed that we couldn't uh, complete is something called Sunwork, Sunwalk, which was a great name, a townhome solar village nestled in the woods. Here's a little display we had for a show that showed um, uh, the features of the home. It shows the homes, or at least some of the homes and their layout. So they were like, you've got three units here, three living units here, and you've got two living units here. But uh, this was toward the end of my of Craig Wolf Solar Design and Construction, and people were beginning to forget and not care about energy in the late 80s, uh, which is when this happened. Disappointing that never got off the ground. This shows uh, uh, insulation here on, for the foundation, and we also made these, this wall a freestanding retaining wall. Right here you can see the top of a thermal break that went down from here down to here uh, that kept this piece of concrete from getting cold and making this piece of concrete on the wall cold. Uh, this is when uh, this is a home that was built by the Stitt, Stitt Construction, and this was back around 2008, which was not a great economic time, but uh, uh, Elmo, I think his name is, Stitt, had... Orlo. Or, uh, I'm sorry? Orlo. Orlo, right, Elmo. Orlo Stitt. Uh, he, he started out about the same time I did. Apparently he was smarter than me because he kept building, whereas I had to I had to retire from building. But nevertheless, these four projects were in Kansas City, and he needed someone to be construction management for those homes. And we're going to see some of the shots, and so this is one of those homes um, for the Ashleys. And the, the the unique thing about this home is that it is all insulated concrete. So you've got an insulated concrete form that goes clear up from the foundation to the roof. And we'll see some shots of that. So this is the first pour of the concrete. Um, this is getting ready for the, the, the third pour, I believe. Go back. Oop, oop. And you can see that we um, first pour or the second pour, third pour, and uh, there you so we're getting ready to pour concrete inside these insulated forms and they are there you can see a good shot of the thickness of the forms here's the concrete being poured down here's the operator of the pumper truck and he's there with his little remote puppy and and uh this is mike fisher and he was he was directing him say oh, stop Okay, go. And so whatever, whatever he needed, this guy would listen and 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 obey those commands. There's an, <clears throat> another day when we're doing the pour. Different guy, different operator. This is Mike again. And this is here's the pipe and here's the concrete right here being poured into that form. And you can see that <clears throat> these are specialized forms. They have little puppies in here that hold the rebar in place. And here's a good shot of the pumper truck pipe going way up in the air and then way down. Uh, and so there's Mike holding on for dear life as he's directing the concrete into the form. Now on the inside, uh, this is the form uh, on the upper level. And you can see that they carve out a spot to put outlets. And then they have a place on the form that allows a wire or plumbing run to be uh, installed along that wall. Another shot showing the same thing where the wires come in here and then runs along that little slot in the form and goes to the uh, electrical box. This is the Schumann residence. Um, and um, uh, I should mention also that Shauna, uh, Shauna Zahner, uh, it, it, on our board, 
who is a co-presenter and they'll she'll start uh, chiming in a little more with Ken as we get into some of this stuff but uh, she was the designer or did a lot of design work for Stitt Construction uh, and she and I worked together um, she helped me with questions and stuff as we were doing the actual construction so here's some outside shots it was a really beautiful home beautiful setting Valerie Schumann was her name we'll see a shot of her later on here's the here's the front Stitt did a lot of very very nice work that the first home we saw from Stitt was kind of a plain Jane home uh, let's call it an, an unusual buyer that he had he had his ideas about how he wanted things done uh, and they were very simple and very plain most of the Stitt Energy projects were a little more creative than that one like this one the Schumann residence now I'm showing the faucet here because they have something called an ice house roof is that the right name Shauna ice house roof yes yes it said it sounded weird but this is an open soffit area here so you've got in these grooves you've got uh air cool air can be sucked into this um, by this ice house roofing system so here is what's going on on the inside this is it's got stitt's name on it and so this is a piece of cardboard and on the edges is folded up about three inches okay so you take these these pieces of of cardboard that are folded up and they the fold goes up so that you can install these um into this into the ceiling but it leaves a gap between the roof the shingle system the the plywood and this cardboard so the it also yeah say go ahead shauna the cardboard or so the cardboard also has a radiant barrier reflecting heat back up on the other side of it, it reflects the heat back to the roof yeah very good roof point. space that space that's created between the roof and the top of the cardboard and so that reflective surface reduces the heat by emissivity and i don't need to i i probably am not smart enough to give you a good explanation of it but if you have a roof that has foil in open air it acts as insulation if you will because it the reduces the emissivity of that heat so so the air starts down here at the soffit and goes up and we'll see a little bit more later uh, it goes up to a ventilated roofing system so here it is so now they're putting the foam right on top of the cardboard and this is the foam insulation by, that makes the house airtight and right here is a shot of that ventilated roof so way down here below the air is coming up from the soffit and it's coming up here to this ventilated uh ridge ridge thank you <laughs> uh, coming up to the ridge and letting the hot air out so it was a pretty cool system these guys are putting on a hot water system but it just happened to be a good shot to show this little guy now <clears throat> And, and here's another shot of their insulation here's the insulation and they when they put the insulation in it is put in kind of running wild so you'll have it'll kind of look like this where you'll have it bubbling out so what they do is they come back here with a, a two foot long blade uh, that where with a handle on each end and they just kind of like scrape it along and scrape it along and they cut off that excess insulation pretty cool and this is what in my mind is the best house technique now is to use this type of foam um, construction here here is again um, the foam that's been blown in the wall and it's been shaved off um, and we'll see another shot here I hope of before we foamed it or uh, put the foam on yeah here we go so they used a, a, a two by two on a two by four wall uh as i did only they ran theirs horizontal which is perfectly fine probably a good idea uh and then when they had an outlet they would just nail a little 18 inch piece of two by two onto the two by four to bring it out so that this electrical outlet 
right here can be flush with the sheetrock. So then they would put the foam in here and then take their um, two foot long blade and and cut off the excess. Now, Craig, yeah. Craig, also just to say, go back to that one slide, that last one. Also just to say that Stitt used trusses extensively for the attic systems, for the roof systems. Yeah. And the trusses had a, a what was, what's called a raised heel truss at every, you know, it was a raised heel so that there was a space where the truss came down and sat on the exterior wall so that when they went and did the spray foam, they had a, a substantial area of eight to 12 inches or so where they could get the spray foam in where yeah. normally you can't, where the where the rafter comes down and sits right on a sidewall. This raised it up so they could get insulation in that area. So the spray foam went all the way from the sidewalls, all the way up at the attic spaces, and even at the, at the exterior walls where the trusses meet the, the top of the wall. So, so the there was no, out here. it was a continuous barrier. Yeah. And running the uh, two by twos horizontally reduces the thermal bridging from outside to inside because the right. wood isn't, is, yeah. will have foam on top of it and the two by fours yeah. will have foam uh, in front of it and the two by twos will have foam behind it. So the only place you have wood coming all the way through is where they intersect. Right. Very good. Now, for those who don't know the answer, um, unmute yourselves as soon as you know what this guy is doing, what he's installing. So, so we are we are going to go through a series of slides, and uh, someone, if someone knows what this is all about, then unmute yourself and tell us. So this is Mike, and he's cleaning up this big long pipe there's there is Valerie Schumann she's uh, observing what this guy is doing it is digging a hole in the ground <laughs> any takers yet no takers yet oh I know what he's he's pouring the um, he's pouring the base of the concrete base for that's going to hold the solar the rotating solar panel ah right. and who, who is that that just spoke me, Shauna. Oh, <laughs> I know Shana, what it you is. words weren't supposed to tell. Oh, I wasn't supposed to tell. Initiated. Okay. <laughs> so you, Sorry. You you blew the contest, Shauna. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is this is the hole that this pipe is going to go into. There it goes. And then they, they've got little standoffs to keep it in the center. And there it is. Getting it, get, getting it plumb, pouring concrete in it. There's the concrete. There it is, getting leveled off. And here is what that looks like. This is a tracking panel of solar panels, a tra tracking system for solar panels. And you can see if you notice the sun there, that it's perpendicular to the sun. And so it will angle back and forth as well as left to right to follow the sun in the sky, no matter what season it is. Great. The mechanics. Is this, is this an old Zoneworks setup? I don't know. Is it Shana, okay. do you know? I don't, I don't think it is, no. I, okay. I'm, not, I'm not sure how, what uh, what the me mechanics are, who produced them? I don't know. Yeah, Zoneworks was really into this in the very early days of the '80s and all in the '90s. I don't know when this was built, but then well, this was now. not. This was this was installed in like 2010. Oh, they're so, gone. Long gone. Okay. Yeah. And so there's a good shot of the home, as well as a good shot of the solar panels looking right at the sun now we're now we're into homes built by others just to show examples of a concept and you'll hear um shauna and ken and maybe even charla pipe in with their intelligence about why some of these things are a good idea and why some of these things are a bad idea so this is an earth contact or an earth bermed home which means that 
the earth is against the sides of the home, they are typically one level unless they've got another level going up here higher. Uh, although sometimes, uh, sometimes they had to build structures that, uh, like the Hoffman residence, which was that one that multi-tiered, they had a two-story back wall and they braced it with a two foot by two foot concrete beam that went all along the back of the house to keep it from bowing in. So anyway, this is an earth berm house. Here's another earth contact, or not earth contact, but an earth sheltered home, which means that you've got earth on the roof. You won't see that in Johnson County. <laughs> it doesn't, that doesn't even look like it's in this country. No, it's it, probably not. Where are they? It's in New Zealand. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would say it has to probably be New Zealand, Australia. <laughs> yeah. And then here, here's more of what you would typically find in the United States for yep. an earth berm home. Uh, there was a, a company called Terradome, I believe it was, that used to yep. do. Um, Out of Independence, Missouri. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Ken and, and uh, Shauna, do you have any comments about the pluses and minuses with these homes? Well, their their biggest their biggest downfall and their biggest problems were trying to keep water infiltration out. It's just like they they um, it's very hard to keep the moisture out of these homes, and eventually the moisture seeped through and then destroyed the structure beneath it. So um, I knew a, a new <coughs> person who built one in in Freeman, Missouri, and they eventually, after about she said it only took about uh, 10, 12 years, and they had to take all the sheltering all the dirt off of the roof and then redo all the roof um, mm -hmm. because it was leaking too much. So it, to yeah. do these homes or to do them properly, even earth contact homes, let alone earth sheltered homes, if the waterproofing on that back wall or any of the isn't done correctly or, you know, it, and it, you know, it's, it's just very hard, very difficult to get the water infiltration to stay yeah. low. So. Mm -hmm. And the the structural costs, and, and I think when we, you and I were, when the three of us were talking about these slides, uh, you said, and they all, all smell like an old shoe. Uh, <laughs> uh, and well, so, um, and the I, caveat I will there. say that of all the earth contact homes, I never did an earth sheltered home, but of all the earth contact homes, I never had one person uh, get back to me with a problem. So apparently we were using the right product. The, the, uh... If they put in uh, heat recovery or energy recovery ventilators in these earth uh, covered homes, your underground homes, that does help. Yeah. Because uh, it's a moisture problem, which I'm saying moisture gets in there. Anywhere moisture can come in, it'll come in. You, you it, it, It's very much any, anything that can leak will leak. And so uh, if water gets in there at all, of course, it causes mildew, mold and all that. And then you smell it. So anyway. Yeah. This, this is John Hen. Uh, what, what's the, uh, can you uh, in, uh, explain the value of the, the dirt uh, uh, against the wall? What, uh, what's the uh, insulation value or what? Well, uh, there, there is an insulation value uh, in, in that the earth uh, at a depth of, uh, and I may have the numbers a little bit wrong, but there's a lag time associated with the temperature of the earth. So the earth is its warmest at eight feet um, in um, all of the fall or the early winter sometime. So it still is a, a warm area. And then it's its coldest uh, in the uh, late spring, early summer, uh, and, you know, at that depth of six to eight feet. So that's one of the benefits. The other benefit is there ain't no way any air infiltration is going to get into this home. And so I'd say that the lag time associated with the temperature of the earth, as well as no insulation, I mean, no air infiltration are probably the two biggest aspects of why these are, why these homes were built in the first place. Sean or Ken, do you have any other thoughts about yeah, that? They, they also had a big sales point in that it's almost impossible for a tornado to damage this home because the way the shaped and everything unless it hits in the front, breaks the glass. But um, normally homes are destroyed because tornadoes go over and they basically have a lifting action and a typically built home, it just pulls, sucks it inward and up. Well, when you have an earth covered home, it tends to just skim over the top. Yeah. Yeah. 
And before we had all these great foam uh, spray foams available, this was a great way to to insulate really well insulate around three sides of the house. So. Yeah. Yeah. And of course you can grow food on it. There's some other aspects that's like sales points. You can grow edible plants on top of your house and all that. Not too many people do, but I mean, that's in your brochures probably. Yeah. On the negative side, real estate agents hated them and they still hate <laughs> them. <laughs> so to keep that in mind. <laughs> now, real estate agents don't really like anything they don't understand completely. And so, um, yep. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> was the, the real estate, was that because they uh, just couldn't sell them? Uh, or do they, they, they just didn't understand them right. and, and didn't know how to sell them. Right. That was what the problem was. And that's <laughs> they the knew also they have a specific buyer. You have homes that are typical homes. They figure most anybody who walks the door is probably interested. People that walk in the doors of underground homes or unusual homes are, you have to find that specific type of buyer that's interested in that specific type of home. And so they know that it's more of a needle in a haystack than it is just, you know, fortuitous yeah. who walks in the door they might be able to sell them they know they can't do that unless they get a very specific buyer for these houses yeah, pretty and, limited and market then it is yeah. it is is the case with any energy efficient home that god help you if you're a builder building an energy efficient home and you don't have a real estate agent who at least is interested in learning <laughs> about them and then learn about them enough that they can sell the features and that right. is is uh, true with any home, including my homes uh, that I built, uh, but certainly with an earth sheltered home where, you know, it takes a, a unique buyer. Uh, you didn't build these things in a subdivision. No. And, um, They're always by themselves. Yeah. Well, I've actually got a subdivision out of them out by me, about by Weatherby. There's a little area that has a, a well, there's actually two areas that have a whole bunch of them all together it's really amazing <laughs> kind, of, kind of unusual yeah i will let's since we're talking about comparing old versus new which is the point of your conversation part of it uh -huh. we do live in a time now that homes like this and this more or less i don't know if underground homes will ever become big time you know in vogue because there's other ways to make homes super efficient now but if you have a home that's innovative we live in a time where you could make a home where you walk in the door, a motion sensor starts explaining to you the features of this home so that a real estate agent could know nothing about the home and they could just let people walk around and as they enter a room, a voice or a, or a computer screen will come on and say, you're looking at this and you're looking at a smart thermostat and you're looking at the, the, the you know, whatever it happens to be and the house can explain itself. Yeah. Good point, that's part of that. That, that, that would be a That'd be great. fantastic way of selling them. That's what I would like to help people do. In my way of doing this, I would like to see people build model homes, super efficient that you walk into and it explains why the house is built the way it is, what's in this house that you can't see, which is pretty much 99% of energy efficient and smart homes and all that is stuff you don't know it's there. You look at it, it looks like a plain home until the home talks to you. So we need to yeah. start doing that. Good idea. <laughs> and, and that's you know, some, suppose that's a premium then they're, those types of homes are going to be 10 to 20 percent over the price of a regular home, and then if you, they don't know the features, they're just going to walk out. Yeah, yeah, not necessarily. I, I understand what you're saying, and that's a typical. Uh, it a lot of times homes are just not built that well. You can take a home, two homes that are built with using the same materials. One of a person is careful about sealing it up with caulk, and making sure that they do a blower door test and get all the leaks fixed and and the insulation is put in properly and all that, and it will guarantee to be performed much better than the home next door where they just slap the insulation in and throw the drywall on. Everybody comes and goes as fast as possible. That home would probably use 20, 30, 40% more energy just because it's a leaky home. And that in and of itself, the homes are identical except for workmanship, craftsmanship. Yeah. You but don't care. care. And the priority. Realtor doesn't tell you that uh, you, you won't pick the good home. That's right. No, well, that's, that's why a lot of people buy a home and then they start comparing bills. And one home that looks like your neighbor's home, one of them has low bills, the other one has high bills. And they think, well, you must be doing something differently. And sometimes it just comes down to how careful the builder was or the crew you got that day that was building the home. So it, it, it's kind of, unfortunately, I guess what I'm saying is it's a luck of the draw thing when it really should be homes should be built, tested, and 
you should be able to turn out homes that are almost identical in terms of efficiency, one after another, and it can be done, and we know how to do it now. It's just it's not really happening yet, but I think those days are coming too. Yeah. So here's the next home. This is called a envelope home in that its name came from this envelope that goes up, and then there's a, a space for air to travel down and circulate back into the bottom part of the home and in here sometimes they would use rock that the this air would would heat up down below uh, and so my negative the positive opinion that these homes tended to perform well but not because of the reason that they uh, that they were designed to perform well they performed well because they were they had lots of uh, walls that were well insulated etc but the concept uh, was e expensive and you could do using some of the things that you've already seen from my homes and from the stit homes that perform better and that were less expensive to build yep. one area that i didn't like was that this mass down here there's no way that this mass if you're walking around up here is going to see you or you're not going to see it it is just warming air which is not nearly as effective as if it is putting radiant heat because it can see you and you can see it. Yeah. Yeah, I would start a, a thermal siphon when during the day, the sun would heat that up on the south side and the air would start moving up and then around by just simple circulation. I call it the, thermal, the convection loop. But the problem would be is that it would tend to warm up during the day and it would tend to warm up the, the thermal insulation or your, your, excuse me, your thermal mass at the bottom. But at night, when you were hoping it'd keep everything warm, it would take the heat that's stored below and it would all migrate to the very top. Right. Yeah. So and here, here's another version of that that uses a, some, some sort of a sun space to, to move that airflow. And then an, another idea that that has not Although there are, are Ken uh, was talking the, the other day about a way these can work well, but this is a cooling tube that moves cooled air into the home based upon pulling the cool coolness, if you will, <clears throat> out of the ground uh, as the air passes through these tubes. Uh, they tend to be a little smelly. And Shauna, you actually had a home that had these, right? I, I built one that I tried to use one too. And it the the tube was not long enough. It didn't uh, cool the air enough. And it also drew humidity into the house. So that was my experiment with my last passive solar house. It didn't work well. <laughs> yeah. So just to touch on, I won't go into a lot of detail, but it's <laughs> kind of complicated to explain. But if you can have a heat exchanger or a heat pump, and all the cooling tubes are external to the home, just like the isolated gain solar system, passive solar, Craig was talking about. If you can externalize the cooling tubes and run them over a heat exchanger of some type, then you can take advantage of the cool of the earth if it's designed correctly without having the problem of the moisture and the mildew and the smell of cave smell going into your home. Mm -hmm. You that outdoors. Yeah, so that, that airflow is isolated then from the inside of the home. Its function yeah. is to provide the, the heat pump with uh, tempered air. Tempered air so that the extremes, of, if you have a heat pump that's underground and you're running air through a cooling tube, what you're doing is letting the heat pump, in essence, not be exposed to the coldest temps or the warmest temps. It's exposed to yeah. uh, tempered Earth, Earth's air. tempered temps. <laughs> right. So it may never get hotter than 100 degree day. It may never see air hotter than 80. And in a zero degree, degree day, you may never see air colder than 25. So, so actually, you don't even really have to use a backup system on a heat pump that much. You get the advantages of an underground heat pump without having the, all the expense of an underground heat pump per se. And if you have a problem with your heat pump, you actually can go in there and repair it. Whereas if you have a problem with your loop, the, the thing that's Ground running the, yeah. the air, or not the air, but the water or the freon, which was the deal of the cooling coils, the copper coil one that you talked about earlier, we discussed it real quick. When you run copper tubing below grade, anything that pokes it or, or does anything to it, your system is done. 
or somebody cuts it accidentally with the trencher or whatever. And the same problem exists if you have these, these uh, poly pipes that go underneath the ground for uh, ground contact. Yeah, that. The, if those, instead of being little copper tubes, those are flexi flexible copper. Instead of using that, if you used a, a poly, I don't know if it's polyethylene or polypropylene or what they are exactly. They're always proprietary piping for um, uh, um, geothermal heat pump systems. Probably PEX, PEX, P-E-X. That's a PEX type system, yes. And, and it, so bottom line is that, again, something goes wrong with it, it springs a leak, somebody puts in a fence and, and digs way down and hits one of them or something, and your loop is now damaged. And the only thing you can do is dig it all up or start over. Yeah. And so it's a good idea. It's a very efficient. All that makes sense. But the downside is if anything happens to it, it's 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 kaput. How does that relate to a geothermal uh, setup then is uh, does that eliminate the problem that this has? Are you talking about one where it goes into the pond or goes straight down? Yes, or or horizontal. I've seen both ways. Horizontal one is the one I'm talking about. They put them normally put them six feet down, and so typically nothing should get that deep enough to 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 nick that pipe. But there's no guarantee. Yeah. And if you go straight downward with a well type system, they do work well especially if you hit a water layer, a groundwater table, okay. except that the EPA hates the people doing this because you're supposed to, to do it correctly, you're supposed to cap off. If you go puncture through an area where there's some groundwater that maybe somebody's using to water their garden or for drinking water, sometimes these contaminate that groundwater. So what you want to do is as you go through it, you're supposed to come back, put in the piping, and then cap off or, or cork with concrete or something where you pe penetrated it at the bottom and at the top, and it's very hard to do that, yeah. then that way you are not uh, polluting or causing uh, problems to that groundwater layer. So most of the time when these are dug, they just dig straight down, they put the pipe in there, they cap off the top and call it good, and then they just let dirt or chemicals or whatever seep into that groundwater. And it's that's the problem. That's why the EPA is, they're not big on these, but... They do work well. Yeah. We're pointing out goods and bads here. I'm not saying that, yeah. you know, if, if put in correctly, like everything, put in correctly, done correctly, it works gangbusters, put in sloppily, it's a problem. So here's a, sloppily. Here our <laughs> next topic, which is an air-to-air -air heat exchanger. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, an ERV, energy recovery ventilator. ventilator. Is that right, Shauna? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, and um, so this, this is a little bit of an octopus in, in terms of where they put it in, but uh, it works the same way as a air to air heat exchanger or an HRV heat recovery ventilator uh, with the with the difference that these are more custom made to uh, where is a good shot of that? Here we go. Uh, um, that somewhere in here they have the ability to take moisture out that is better than an HRV. And mm -hmm. I'll, I'll let Ken and Shauna describe the techniques for doing the ERV. You want to take this, Shauna? Well, I, I, okay, so I have an ERV, but I have a desiccant wheel in mine. So as my hot air goes out, it... it uh, it helps warm the cold air that's coming in in the wintertime, and it works opposite in the summertime. So it helps cool the air that's coming in. It uses the cool air that's already in my house uh, mm -hmm. to help cool that air that's going out as it exchanges it. But I have the desiccant wheel, which then takes the humidity out of the air, and that's what the ERV, the energy recovery ventilator, does. Right. So it, it, you got the outside air that comes in, and as it comes in, it picks up the heat from the inside air uh, and sends that into the house like an air-to-air -air heat exchanger does. Only the difference is if you had 80%, 85% humidity here, some of that moisture gets taken out. And rather than dumping 85% moist air into the house, now you've taken out some of the moisture and this is less humid, which your air conditioner is trying to take out in the first place. Right. 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 The difference is, is that on an ERV, her desiccant wheel rotates very slowly. And so what's happening is it's constantly removing it. Let's use this example. 
you got air coming in from the outside. What is, let's say it's warmer outside. It's a hot, moist day outside. You've got air-conditioned air. You've already paid to cool inside your house going out. And then you've got warm, moist air coming in. And so your, your wheel that's turning in Charlotte's, uh, Charlotte, in Shauna's case, that, that moist air coming in, the desiccant, that's the same thing as those little silicon packs that you get when you buy shoes or something. It says, don't eat this. Same thing. It's you, that, that will pick up the moisture in the incoming airstream from outside, and then it rotates into the outgoing airstream and dumps that moisture so that you constantly have moisture being picked up as it comes in and being dumped in the outgoing airstream as it's going out. So it, 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 it kind of averages the humidity. And so you have less moist air coming in than going out. And then it, uh, the other system is uh, like this. It's also an ERV or could be. The, the heat exchanger core, the blue part here, this light blue in the center, number three, that has a membrane center like, um, like house wrap that the incoming moist air, the moisture in that air, the vapor can penetrate through the heat exchanger and equalize with the outgoing airstream. But water droplets and all, they just stay there, the in incoming airstream. They do not necessarily, water can't pass through, but water vapor can. And since it's constantly taking the vapor out, you really don't need a drain. Some of them do have a drain, but technically, in theory, you're equalizing again, so moisture doesn't really drop out the bottom. Now, if you have an HRV where there's no moisture exchange, no humidity exchange between the incoming and outgoing airstream, that's when the warm, moist air coming in meets the cold, dry air going out, and it drops the moisture out, just like in your air conditioner in your furnace, and that water has to go somewhere, the condensate, it goes down a drain, just like your furnace. If you look at it in the air conditioning mode, there's water coming out of it going down a drain somewhere. Yeah. So same idea. So all, the, all this to say that the biggest, we're explaining all this about air to air heat exchangers or ERVs to say that the, the biggest um, threat to our homes is buildup of humidity on the inside. And we want to reduce that humidity while we're bringing in fresh air, especially when we have a really well sealed up house. Right. So it's very easy to get it uh, stale air. It's very easy to get humidity buildup and all those things that we just don't want. So. And those cause the problems, especially where you don't see there's problems behind walls and things. Right. Ooh, okay. So the we've seen wall systems that uh, like my two by four, two by two wall, which I, uh, I like, although there's better solutions now and those better solutions are the, uh, the stit model where they use a, a, a foam uh, to, to in the ceiling and in the walls, as well as the, uh, um, the insulated concrete panels where, you're, where you pour concrete into insulation and that those work well. We've seen things we don't like, like some of the earth contact and the envelope home, uh, but there's one type of home that we haven't talked about, and that is the SIPS panel and I'm going to turn it. I found a neat little video that quickly describes them and as long as it starts and works. Energy Panel Structures, EPS, specializes in using structural insulated panels or SIPs for new home construction. Our structural insulated panels use high performance rigid foam chemically bonded to oriented strand board or plywood. This continuous bond provides incredible strength and resistance to impact. Optional electrical wire chases can be placed horizontally or vertically in the panel. Wall panels are installed over and fastened to a base plate. Assembly starts by fastening corner panels together using both interior and exterior surface studs and SIP screws. Sealant prevents air and moisture from penetrating the panel. This foam is used to seal along the bottom of the panel as well as in between each panel joint. EPS packages include pre-assembled factory insulated headers along with window and door cutouts designed to match each custom-designed home. Adjoining panels are connected using a block spline system, 
and approved fasteners. All EPS panels are numbered and marked. This means walls go together quickly as they tilt up and are put in place. Another major advantage of our panels over stick-built systems is that EPS panels can be manufactured up to 24 feet tall or 24 feet wide. Fabricated panels are cut to fit each project and ready to assemble. The panel edges are factory routed to accept plates and splines. EPS manufactured pre-engineered floor truss systems complete the package. SIPS roof panels can be used to create large open spans or vaulted ceilings. EPS manufactures roof trusses which may also be used depending on the specific home design. The EPS building system creates a superior building envelope with high thermal resistance and minimal air infiltration. Home building is complex. Worry less about the details of energy efficient building practices. Trust EPS and our network of authorized dealers to build your once in a lifetime. Good video. <laughs> yeah, I saw that and I said, wow, for three, three minutes, uh, that's going to do a much better job than uh, than I could ever do. Yeah. Now you notice they emphasize caulking because yes. that's critical when you do SIPs. It's critical, critical. I mean, I yeah. say that twice. And they didn't talk about ventilation systems, but you almost required to have one because A, they're tight, and B, they're made out of particle board or OSB or something typically. Even, even uh, plywood will delaminate if it's moist enough. So, um, you, it, again, like Shauna said earlier, humidity control is vital in these, really in any home that's relatively tight, but especially a SIPS home. Yeah. yeah. And fresh air. <laughs> and fresh air is always nice. Fresh filtered air. Yes. <laughs> so we're open for any, any questions. Uh, that's, that's basically the presentation, but we're, we're happy to answer anything you've got. Uh, this is Wayne Horlicker. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Yep. Okay, <clears throat> I'm in Colby, Kansas. You might know our son, Jim Horlicker, who is also uh, tuned in this morning. I see yeah. his name here. Yeah. Uh, I'll say <clears throat> my first question is, do you have a DVD available of this program that we could get so that we could show to uh, uh, people around Colby? Or uh, it, e even even easier, uh, Ken has created for the Heartland Renewable Energy Society a YouTube channel, and we take all of our presentations now uh, and put them on YouTube. So as long and as you have an internet time. connection and a way of projecting that, or even doing your own Zoom session, you would be able to show this presentation. Okay. You can also. You can access them all. It'll be available on the HRES Heartland Renewable Energy Society website as well. You can either watch it on that or you can click where it says YouTube on the bottom of any YouTube video and it'll take you to the YouTube channel. So, And will that be on for a certain length of time, uh, a probably year? From now on. Yeah. Once we get it edited and out there, it'll probably take us a week or two or three to get it edited and uploaded and, and working good. But at, within a couple of weeks, I would think we're going to be have that one available and then it's just stay up there as long as I guess from now on. Huh, Greg? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yes, that was uh, my interest. <clears throat> we, uh, we own an area here in Colby, Kansas, that's 26 acres, uh, pretty much in the center of town. It's uh, not at the perimeter at least. And uh, our covenants call for energy efficient building. <clears throat> and uh, we're down now, we built a spec house using the SIP panels and a lot of that technology. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it is sold. Uh, we only have one lot left now out of the 26 lots. So uh, we would invite any of you folks uh, who are coming west on 
Interstate 70. Interstate 70 goes right by the south edge of Colby uh, to stop in, and, and we could give you a tour of the area and point out some of the features of the various houses on there. Uh, be glad That'd be to great. Come. Congratulations. Uh, I remember Jim talking about it a long time ago. Yes, <laughs> this Jim has been a, been a long project. We've owned the acreage for 40 years. Yeah. So it hasn't developed very quickly, but. Well, it was first used as a pasture for Jim and for our daughter and, and Jim's horses. Can you hear Millie? She's, she's on a computer than I am. She's a little soft. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, uh, you can find us uh, at 750 West Pine Street is our address in Colby. Uh, Jim can give you that too if you have his contact. Great. <laughs> Just, but, just contact me and, and I, I can I can uh, I can get get uh, the Horlacker's information to you. Okay, good enough. Well, Thanks. Thank, thank you very much uh, for in letting us be included. Jim notified us this morning that this was going to be on. So well, thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Appreciate it very much. All right. All right. All right. We wanted to say hello, everybody. Hi. <laughs> the um, old and the almost three year old. We've all been listening. Uh, that's that's the reason we got here to to Loveland, Colorado, is because of these these two little little guys. You can see them. And, and your daughter. How old is the youngest one now? Three months. Three months. All right. Uh, <laughs> it's good to see you. And um, so that was wonderful. We really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, everybody, for sharing all your wealth of knowledge. It was great. <laughs> Yeah, we thanks enjoyed being a part of it, Greg. Thank you. Say what? We enjoyed uh, being a part of it and seeing it, and it was great information. And and then the big treat at the end here to see the family. Yeah. <laughs> the kids, yeah. You know, the kids. The camera to work upstairs. Besides that, there was, you know, it's good to keep us quiet upstairs. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's always good. Yeah. One of the best things about being involved in the solar, a lot of things change over time, but I used to teach solar at the Red Rock Solar Program back in the early 80s uh, in Golden, Colorado. And uh, the the students, they'd start talking about, well, you know, this may change, that may change. I say, yeah, but the sun angles probably won't change for a million or two million. <laughs> so it'll probably be all right designing around the sun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the one thing that has changed that it not, doesn't change in my mind, but I think it's changed in the public's mind, is to me, passive solar is so simple, so straightforward, and why we're not using it every day is a mystery to me. Uh, and it's never I going away. Homes, I thought <laughs> this is a ship that's never going to sink, and it sure as hell sank. Yeah, but the sun's not going away. So. The sun's not going away. We, we tend to listen to whoever we have in charge and uh, they tend to dispute or promote whatever they are into. And so we've been given different messages over the years. Yeah. Okay, folks. Well, Thank you so much for uh, coming and joining us. And uh, we look forward to our next meeting. Um, it's, it's interesting that we're doing Zoom sessions now, which is a more uh, energy efficient way of doing things. We're not driving gas from one place to the other. And um, it's, it's probably a good thing. I think a lot, of more, a lot more people are gonna use Zoom rather than gasoline. Yeah, that'd be good. I think this is a culture change. When, when's your next presentation? Probably in December maybe sometime. Maybe not till, sometime maybe not till after Christmas, maybe. Yeah. yeah, maybe January even, it depends on we don't have a lot of time now. You got two holidays in a row coming up and not a lot of time in between. So, yeah. But watch for us. <laughs> Thank yeah, you, we'll, everybody. Great. We'll send out a notice uh, and it'll also be on our website once we figure that out. Good. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Well, thank you all for coming, uh, especially Bryson and Jim Horlicker. I haven't seen your faces in a long time. Yep. And, uh, uh, and, and, so anyway, thank you very much. I guess Hi, I, I will sign off now. All and right. uh, good to see you all. God bless. Have a have a safe COVID nineteen Thanksgiving.
Same you to too. you guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.